Hey, everyone. Um, I'm going to talk to you today about hacking support groups and what that means for our health, our futures, and healthcare in general. But first, I want to share my story. In all of the places that my genome could have gone right and could have gone wrong, my future changed when I took a genetic test and learned that I had up to an 87% chance of getting breast cancer and up to a 60% chance of developing ovarian cancer in my lifetime. At the time that I found this, I was 25 years old. That was 14 years ago. 14 years, and I, I was told by my doctors, but you're lucky. You have access to precision medicine. You have options. You, you have knowledge. Knowledge is power, and you can act on that. Well, I'm here to tell you I waited. What I wanted, because I knew that the options that we had in our community weren't good enough, I wanted better options for myself. I wanted better options for my family. And what ended up happening is I kept waiting patiently as a patient. And what I learned is we fell through the medical cracks quite often. This is a really great story in the LA Times that talks about how previvors face these agonizing decisions. In two weeks, I'm about to go through my fifth surgery, and I have more to go. I want something better than removing body parts for my community and myself. And I waited for it for so long, and it never came. But what did come in, in place of that was an incredible group of women, people who were facing the same struggles that I faced. And in the beginning, I can tell you that being a previvor was incredibly isolating. Not even my own friends and family understood what I was going through, but these women did. So as we found ourselves uh, navigating these decisions and supporting each other, we learned so much, and what I found was these groups were a lifeline, not only for me, but many other patients who come to this conference every year. Patients who live and breathe on social media and need social media in order to connect with each other and to find knowledge. This is a support system, a life support system for us. It's important to me, and we need to protect it. Well, in 2018, the news of Cambridge Analytica hit. And I started learning how, um, through uh, a, a data breach in the user APIs, data was scraped to create psychographic targeting profiles with data from Facebook. And I asked myself a simple question. I knew something was wrong, and I wanted to know what the bigger picture was. So I became a hacker. <laughs> And I can tell you, in the beginning, it was an accident. I wanted to know what were the privacy implications of having a health support group on Facebook? Such a simple question. With something so critical for us for so many years, I wanted to know the answer to that. Well, I started digging into APIs. And as it turns out, I have this background in technology. I started my career in Silicon Valley. I understand data flows and design thinking and all of the technologies that affect this community. And, and so as I did this, I was kind of left unsupervised. And it turns out I knew just enough to be a little bit dangerous. <laughs> and thank goodness, I found somebody, an expert, who could help. Um, you're going to hear from Fred Trotter soon. I brought all of my research to him. And in the beginning, I didn't know the scale or the impact of what I had found. Three days after her, our first talk, he came back to me and he said, I need to speak to everyone you've talked about, uh, about this vulnerability, because if exploited at scale, it can cause a loss of life. And I, I thought to myself, are you crazy? What are you talking about? This is social media. This is just data. It doesn't impact our lives. But then, as I started bringing in other experts, Fred helped me find people who could corroborate and look at this problem from a broader point of view. Experts in informed consent, people who understand the law and the policies that are affecting this problem. 
And it started the, the, the beginning of my crash course in cybersecurity. I learned about responsible disclosure, threat modeling, all of the things that within the cybersecurity community, they live and breathe, but quite often in healthcare and on social media, we don't know the first things about. We called the vulnerability Sick Girl. That is an acronym for Strict Inclusion Criteria Group Reverse Lookup. And essentially, it was a way, at its most dangerous permutation, for me, outside of a group, to scrape the real names and the lists of the groups, along with the, the health fact about them for a group with strict inclusion criteria. So for example, my group or support group deals with BRCA or hereditary cancer. But there are millions of groups out there. Groups like people with HIV positive <laughs> results, people who are um, dealing with mental health issues, transgender people, people who might not want to have that information out there. Scraping the list and then combining it is what I found with another data table that allowed us to see not only the real names of people, but their employers, their phone numbers, their physical addresses. This could be done at scale programmatically for millions of patients. And I asked myself, well, what do we do in this situation? Well, we started with a vulnerability report that we submitted directly to Facebook. We said, hey, you guys, you need to fix this. And we expected them to embrace this with open arms and to fix everything immediately. And what we got instead was, this isn't a problem. We see this as working by design. If these groups have a problem with it, they can go to another platform. And we were like, what? <laughs> And then I started to understand why. It turns out there's a pattern of behavior here. And as I started to learn about the problems, I also started to see the groups that were being harmed. I'll give you an example of a group of 15,000 sexual assault survivors who were hacked. Their information was scraped. They were terrorized. These lists along with their employer's information, were used so that they could, the hackers could tell the women that they would contact their employers, that they would contact their ex-husbands, um, and, and it could be used to extort these people, because that's what black hats do. We had to do something, so we submitted an FTC complaint in December of last year, and that started a federal investigation, and this is a letter of, uh, in, in February for a congressional inquiry from the Energy and Commerce Committee. None of this is resolved yet. We had an, a $5 billion FTC settlement that related to Cambridge Analytica just a couple of months ago, but what does the future hold? Well, if I had a crystal ball or a really good predictive algorithm to tell you what the future holds, around the time the FTC settlement happened, I started to recognize three fundamental truths at the exact same time, if anybody watches Hamilton. <laughs> Number one, data sharing exists on a spectrum. There is on one part of the spectrum life-saving data sharing that happens. On the other, there is life-threatening data sharing. There is, similar to the electromagnetic spectrum, light that we can see, but that's only a sliver of the full spectrum. There's the light that we can't see, and power that can be used for our benefit or to harm us. Number two, when we think about the future, I think we can look to the past. And I've been thinking a lot about this and trying to come up with a reference or a parallel to what we're facing as patient support groups. And I keep coming back to this guy. Do you guys know who this is? This is King George. 250 years ago, he ruled over a set of colonies and had a lot of unfair laws and practices, and they actually set up what was called a kangaroo court. <laughs> a kangaroo court is a, a, a court that enacts or practices governance but it isn't a representative body. So just last week, Facebook announced this new Supreme Court that is supposed to be a way to independently regulate the power that this platform has. 
I do not think that this is legitimate. And I think the parallels between King George and Zuckerberg are real. Our generation has created a new form of power. And we need to start thinking about how people in the past have looked at power and thought about checks and balances on po power and developed things anew. Well, our founding fathers did it. And every generation, when we face new forms of power, we actually have not just the need, we have a responsibility to find the rights and checks and balances to make sure that power doesn't abuse us. And if we don't, I am concerned for the future of our children. The stakes are really high here. So what is my ask? I come back to, in all the time that I was patiently waiting for better options, I kept looking to Silicon Valley with all their billions. I kept looking to healthcare and cancer research for these people with so much power on these shiny stages to come and save me. And what I needed to do instead is look to the people beside me. I needed to look to the people beside me because they've always been the ones who have had our interest at heart. And they are the ones who need to have power in their hands to make decisions to chart our futures. So I'm going to leave you with this. It's a little video of our work, which is the result of so much incredible thinking and so many important mentors who have helped us along this incredibly scary path. Um, and it's the story of collective governance. We started a nonprofit called The Light Collective. And if you are a peer support group who is in need of thinking about new ways to chart your destiny and take your power back, when very often we have so little autonomy when it comes to the tech platforms where we reside, I would love for you to join us. In fact, I am tweeting out our proposal for collective self-governance as a counter-proposal for what this Supreme Court uh, that was just announced um, is. Because I think we can do this a better way through the people who are affected. And so with that, I will leave you. And thank you um, for everybody in this room for your help over the last year. I'll drop the mic and roll the video. <laughs> thank you. The healthcare system really wasn't set up to meet our needs and adapt in the way that we were rapidly adapting. And so what did we do? A lot of us found each other, and we did that through social media. And once we found each other, we realized, oh my God, we have a lifeline. We have a way to learn from each other and understand we're not alone. Last year, our support group uncovered a massive security flaw that affected the safety and privacy of millions of patients on social media. We're making sure that the communities that are not only built on Twitter, but on Facebook are, are really stepping back and, and thinking we need to have better policies and procedures in place for growing a patient support community in a way that's sustainable and is providing the best level of resources possible for patients that are desperately seeking information while engaging with these platforms. Now we're seeking a path forward in a way that will enable us to trust again. As moderators and as community advisors and facilitators, our goal is to create a safe place for our participants to be able to come to and know that what they're sharing and the information they're receiving is private. Our support groups and our online communities need the freedom to be vulnerable with each other on the internet. We have come together this weekend to Washington, D.C. to discuss all of the problems in associating support groups with Facebook. We are concerned that the information that we're providing on Facebook in these support groups are gonna be shared without our permission. How do you govern a, a community that's only beginning to emerge? How do you write rules Everybody is jumping in, clinicians, whether that is researchers, whether that is patients. The Light Collective is on a mission to foster healthy human connection for peer support communities on the internet. Patient safety and patient dignity are things that you do 
from the start. It's part of the rules of the road. It's not a feature of a system that you need to account for or schedule into your maintenance. Either the design of your systems and your online systems respects patient privacy or you're part of the problem. We are building tools and resources that can help your peer support group. Please join us as we shape this vision.